One of the big things that people always talk about is real world data. So one of the things I've been involved in in the last decade is the National Prostate Cancer Hoard. Distance impedes radiation access. The benefit, the beauty of this is you've got the technology. Clinical and methodological collaborations are key. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, have, to be here, have this great audience, meet some of you again, um, who I've met over the last couple of years, even through research. So I start with this. So my background is I'm dual trained in medical and radiation oncology, and I work very closely with surgeons. So I think multidisciplinary care is a big part of it. I also start this topic beyond trials, being a professor now, but never wanting to do academia. It was the last thing I wanted to do. Even about 10 years ago, I remember having an argument with someone saying, why bother with research? It's just a waste of time. It doesn't achieve anything. It's all very political. And then 10 years later, lots of things can change. But it's also partly because I didn't have the love of research. And I didn't know what the breadth of research is, because many of us believe that research is what you do in a lab. Many believe it's what you do in a trial. But everyone can do research. And the main thing, I'm going to tell you the main lesson from the talk before I do the talk, it's all about the research question. If you've got a good research question, it's about working out how you design the study and then how you deliver it. And along the way, you can build the skills and actually deliver impact. One of the big things that people always talk about is real world data. What is real world data? It's actually using the resource that you have around you here and now. It's not about setting up a big facility. Everyone has patient notes. Everyone has billing records, different sources, cancer registries. That is vital information. It tells us everything from access to equity to quality. I mean, we don't talk about quality. You know, the variation in care that you can get in quality is absolutely pivotal to actually people's outcomes. Everyone thinks that we need to try and build on what is the apex to try and get that other additional gain, but there's huge variation. And I wanna just show some examples of just having data using your everyday notes, using actually quite coordinated pathways across your hospitals. You can do lots of research. You can look at access. Are people getting these evidence-based therapies? You can do clinical epidemiology. What's that? Well, there's two ways of thinking about it. Do people with the same disease get the same treatment if, or different treatment? If people get the same treatment, do they have the same outcome? That's clinical epidemiology because we know that there's a variation in both. I've put geographic information systems, how far people travel, how do people access the care? Where should we build our care? Why is this hospital built here? Should it have been built 15 miles down the road? Should it have been built in a different area? Where should the next cancer center be built? These are all the things or systems that will deliver on a population level improvements and outcomes for patients. And then the modeling studies. How do we actually inform the politicians? How do we get politicians to invest more in cancer or to react better, particularly during the pandemic? So they're just different examples that I'm going to give. So if we just take a very basic one, under treatment of locally advanced disease in prostate cancer. So one of the things I've been involved in in the last decade is the National Prostate Cancer Audit. We cover 150 hospitals, all the National Health Service hospitals in England, and we look at their performance. We're able to compare it to 95% of hospitals that deliver care in the UK. And one of the questions is, all right, prostate cancer, we can cure it. High risk prostate cancer, we can cure. You need radiotherapy or surgery, that's obvious. So we would expect if you're eligible for treatment, what percentage would you expect if someone comes with you with prostate cancer and it's a curable state, what percentage do you think will end up getting treatment? What percentage? 100%, 90%, 80%, you said 80%. Yeah, the average is about 60% and there's a huge variation. So these are funnel plots. So if you look on your left and your right hand side, what you can see on the right hand side, these dots are individual hospitals in the UK. You can see, depending on where you're treated in the UK, there's a 50 to 95% chance of your likelihood of getting treatment. So this is not about the two or three months benefit. This is about whether you get treatment or not. But no one knew this until we reported it. Everyone thinks, well, everyone gets treatment. Everyone comes to our hospital. We give such a good service. We smile at our patients. We know what we're talking about. But nearly 50% of patients were not getting treatment. The biggest factor that we found, so the question is, well, why is that happening? The biggest factor, so we looked at age, we looked at comorbidity, how fit they were, socioeconomic status. The biggest variation is how we manage people over 70. So all that variation. So if you were 60, yeah, the rate is about 75, 80%. But if you're 75, it goes down to 40 or 50% because we don't know 
or are not as good at oncogeriatric care as we should be. So if you don't measure it, you don't know. So anyone who says we have great outcomes, we're giving treatment, if you don't measure it. This is just real world data research studies. So that simple question, what percentage of people with a locally advanced disease get treatment? And you saw the variation. And then the second question is, what are the determinants or what are the factors associated with it? This is then just in terms of, you know, these become big papers as well. It's not a question of New England Journal of Medicine, but these end up being major pieces of work that teach you skills in big data, clinical epidemiology, health services research to actually produce that output. And anybody can do this work. It's about having the data resource to begin with. What's the other factor? It's obvious. Distance impedes radiation access. So the further you live away from um, a facility, the less likely to get you are to get it. That sounds like a problem, but actually, is it a political problem? Is it a societal problem? Because it seems obvious if you live 200 kilometers away, you're less likely to get something than 100 kilometers away. But is that right? What's the research question then? That's just life, you just live here? Well, there are different research questions that come out. So one of the things that they've done in Australia, and if you look at the map on the bottom right, is that all the cancer centers in the, um, in the dark colors are on the coastal areas, which are very populous. All the minority groups, the Aboriginal groups, are in those sort of pinkish colours. So they live away from where the cancer is accessed. So we're actually compounding disparities in care. So we look at actually where's the access. We see the distance is greatest, but the distance is greatest in the most marginalised populations. We're not going to improve a population level outcome by the rich and the wealthy doing better and better and better. We do it by bringing everyone else with us. Again, health services research allows you to look at distance. It allows you to map populations by understanding the sociodemographics. You then can see the association. This then becomes political because it then changed Australian policy for where they then locate the radiotherapy centers. So you're talking about something that has a powerful national impact, barely from it. A similar thing that we did in the UK was to try and understand, and we use the term inverse care law, is basically, so this is England and what we were looking at is the access to by distance or travel time to the nearest surgical or radiotherapy center. Now the dark red are centers where it's over two hours to access it for patients who get treated. What we also know that these are the rural areas. Within those rural areas is one thing actually people having to travel further, but we then try to see, well actually, is there a gap if you're in a rural area, whether you're rich or poor, and what we could see is that actually, if you're from a lower socioeconomic group, that red line, you actually have to travel further before it. This is then fed back into NHS policy, and they're trying to now develop, actually, where are we going to put these new services? How are we actually going to change the scope of what we do? And I'm going to come in the next talk to a piece of work we did around how you can plan this in advance. How do you plan your system? So we can use big data geographic information systems, epidemiology. So these are all different types of research techniques which have national impact in what they do. I don't know how it was here, but during the pandemic, we had uh, a major issue where everything shut down, surgery shut down in the UK. The only referrals that were coming through were super urgent referrals, people with sort of bleeding or very clear symptoms or signs. And one of the things that we saw, so what the lockdown in the UK was, March 2020, around April time, it became clear, hang on, we've got a problem. Everything was shut down in the hospital. No surgery was happening, IT was happening. And there was a policy directive, stay at home, stay safe, protect the public. We thought, well, what's gonna to happen to cancer patients? They've shut everything down. Public health messaging is don't come. We know that people, many people are diagnosed with cancer who have very vague symptoms, oh, my stomach's not quite right, or I feel something in the back, they're not going to come. And the government were very strict on that. So one of the things we did, and this was something that was done in a four or five week period, and uh, we published in the Lancet Oncology, was to ask, well, actually, if people aren't coming to their primary care physician with aches and pains, then what will happen is that people either come as emergencies, or people will come as urgent referrals. And we know both of those are associated with later stage of diagnosis and worse outcomes. So we modeled it. So we looked to see, well, actually, if lockdown continues for three months, six months, 12 months, what is gonna happen in terms of excess deaths as a result of that policy? 
And so we were able to show for major cancers, breast, colorectal cancer, lung, esophageal cancer, that there would be an estimated, if we continued for six months, 60,000 life years lost. These are people who could have been cured, particularly with bowel cancer was the major one, um, and some with breast cancer who didn't get it. This had a major effect, again, in terms of the policy perspective of sending it to the NHS and saying, well, what about cancer patients? And they started to change their directives or they started to realize that actually they needed to improve the capacity. But with that comes economics. What's the cost? What is the cost of a life? And so we did some health economic modeling. So you take those years of life lost and basically you work out, well, actually, what is the age group of people dying from these diseases? The big thing between COVID and cancer is cancer doesn't care what age you are. So there are lots of people who are part of the workforce, who are providing productivity for the health system, carer duties, et cetera. But you can put a cost to that. Whereas most of the deaths with the COVID pandemic were 70, 75, 80. And so in terms of productivity, if you want to look at an economic cost, it was very different. And we sure the government estimated that there was only going to be 3,000, what they described as quality adjusted life years that were going to be lost. When we did this piece of work just for four cancers and looking at treatment delay, 36,000 quality adjusted life years. They made up the numbers. So that's the other thing. We get policy. You're told what to do because of policies that come up from the government. But actually what we don't have is clinicians, clinician scientists, academics looking and thinking, well, that's not right. That doesn't make sense. I'm trying to react to my service, which is these people are going to die. But how am I going to convince people? And you have to tell them about the money. You have to tell them, actually, your economy is going to suffer from this. And that's what we did. So these also then formed part, you know, there's all these reviews now about what happened during the pandemic. And so this was considered, but this is another type of research. So we worked with development economic economists to do it. We use the same baseline data and they were able to provide this type of modeling. So again, this all just comes from real world data, it comes from the questions, it comes from bringing the right expertise around you and it's around then delivering that to have policy impact. So it's a different type of research, but it can be very effective. One of the big things I'm asked or involved in, so I'm clinical director for the National Cancer Audit. So these are 10, can we cover 10 cancers, ovarian, breast, esophageal, bowel, and we cover all the NHS hospitals and we look have oversight for the whole pathway from diagnosis to sort of long-term outcomes. We look at medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology. And one of the things people ask is, well, how do we set up a quality management program? What indicator should we choose? You know, if you go to different groups, they say, oh, we need 60 indicators, we need 70 indicators. No one ever collects them. No one ever compares it. So one of the things we wanted to do was to see, can we develop a core or minimum data set of outcome measures that can be collected by any cancer center in the world? So we used um, a type of methodology, which is the Delphi consensus process. Again, this is a proper research methodology. No, it's not trials, but it's something that can be effective. This was published in the Lancet Oncology. We collaborated with ASCO, the WHO Aortic. And really what we did, we started off, first of all, going, well, what's in the literature? Seriously, if you look in the literature, you realize it's very hard to have an original research question because so much has done before, but it's really important. So we got people who had not done research, MSc students to do systematic reviews of the literature, all published um, to look at. And we found 216 quality indicators that had already been used routinely for medical, surgical, and radiation oncology. We then had a series of workshops, and then we whittled it down to 34 indicators. We then did two rounds of a Delphi consensus process internationally, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, high-income countries, and we eventually came down to nine core indicators. So this was a process about getting consensus. What should we measure? How should we measure it? And it's very pragmatic. So if you're a count center in a very low-income country, in Ghana, for instance, you know, important things would be, well, proportion of patients who have a biopsy before treatment who's got complete staging. It sounds obvious, but you don't need to necessarily see who's had HER2 collected. What you do know you need to make sure is that people have staging because from a quality perspective, if you start that correctly, then you're prioritizing people appropriately. You're giving them the right medical oncology care. So this is how we went about it. So this was a consensus. So these are the nine indicators which are now being taken up by the WHO and the City Cancer Challenge for implementation in different country contexts. As well as defining research sort of quality indicator, you can also define research priorities. So this was a piece of work in Zambia, which is, well, 
we know how research works. You were just talking about, well, what should we do? Should we decide our own research agenda or should we borrow other people? What happens often in places like Sub-Saharan Africa is people come with lots of money and say, we want to do our research in your country with your samples, with your patients, and we're going to take that and take it back to our country. It's a new form of colonialism, unfortunately, but you pay to play now. And one of the big things we wanted to do is, well, actually, what do the people who actually live and work within the system in Zambia want for their research priority? So we worked with the urologists and the oncologists and the primary care physicians to ask, what is your agenda? We did another Delphi format. Again, different country context. It was brilliant. We ended up with five key areas that they were going to look at. Awareness of cancer, lack of diagnostics, difficulties with healthcare coordination. Again, research methods, systematic review, Delphi consensus process. All of this work has been published and is now in their National Cancer Control Plan. So just to show you how you can build up in bit, bits. I'll move on. Um, this was the systematic review that was done. And this is also qualitative research. Has anyone here done qualitative research? Yeah, no, I'm just asking in terms of methods because a lot of people still, when you talk, oh, it's not science. Oh, it's not, you know, it's not, this is, this is just something you do. You, you know, you're there with the tape recorder and you ask some questions. But actually, if you speak in anthropology, for instance, when you speak to a social anthropologist, this is the, the bear. What, what is the reality of actually what's happening? So this was a piece of work just looking and doing qualitative interviews with people around what are their training needs. So it's just, again, another form of research. I'm going to finish off with a trial, though, an implementation trial, which is slightly different. Um, and this is a study that I'm leading called the Archery Study. So this is looking, everyone's heard of AI. Everyone loves AI. It's obviously going to be the future. But one of the big questions I, I had about AI, because everyone talks about AI and radiotherapy, that, OK, it's going to trans, you know, I'll lose my job. My friends will lose my, their jobs. Everyone will lose their job because AI will do everything. And people had already decided this was going to be amazing. But one of the questions was, well, what's the technology look like? So the MD Anderson Cancer Center, people will know, Texas had developed something called the Radiotherapy Planning Assistant. Their thing was, you take a CT scan, head and neck, um, cervix, you upload it, and there are some tools that can mark the areas that you need to treat, contouring. We can spend hours doing that, you know, you see the radiation oncologists go to their bunker and say, oh, we're doing contouring, leave us alone. This is a really intense intellectual process going on. We'll keep saying that until you actually go downstairs and everyone's listening to their Walkman and we're surfing the internet. And also, <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see the reality. But one of the things that we did see, though, is that it seemed to work or do pretty good. So one of these is the manual process and one of these is the artificial intelligence process. But what we don't know is on a large scale for different cancer types, what's the quality of it? Can it be implemented in different country contexts? What's the time saving? And importantly, what's the cost saving? They've not even done that in the UK. We've not even generated it. So the idea, and this is an NCI funded study, which is happening in South Africa, Jordan, India, and Malaysia at the moment. So six sites across three tumor types, so head and neck, prostate, uh, and cervix. And the idea is to recruit 330 patients for each and 1,000 patients for these three tumour types. And we're going to ask that question in these different country settings. What's the quality? What's the time saving? What's the cost saving? Um, and then we're going to compare it to the gold standard and assess. The benefit, the beauty of this is you've got a technology. It works on a web-based server. If you can prove its quality, it can be done cheaply. But what the MD Anderson have committed to, if it meets its endpoints, is that they're going to offer it not for profit to every public sector, loan, middle income, country institution. So it actually has fantastic reach because one of the biggest issues that we have in radiation oncology is workforce. Physicists who do a lot of this, dosimetrists, as well as radiation oncologists. And we did it as a multi-arm study. So we started with cervix um, and head and neck cancer and we added in prostate. So we got additional funding for that as well. So it's adaptable. So... Just overall to conclude, I don't think cancer research is just trials or slab science. There's huge scope for big data research. We have that as a resource to us. It comes down to the question, the methods, 
and having the right expertise around you and working with the right groups to do that. And I think clinical and methodological collaborations are key. So hopefully I think I can inspire some people to do different types of research so we can actually have policy change and impact. And these are the different teams that I work with and occasionally work with this man. So uh, thanks very much for your time. <laughs>